The LAMAS project came about to demonstrate that it's totally possible to move from a mainstream lifestyle to an alternative lifestyle whilst keeping a fairly good quality of life. And so, and that in essence is, is what the whole project is, is about. It's about showing that an alternative is not only possible but also attractive and healthy and desirable in many ways. Come on then. Hello, lovely. You'll do anything for an apple, won't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Patience. Yeah. So this is Nefa. She's my main milking cow at the moment. And that's Blossom, who's her daughter. And their main purpose in life is to kind of graze these fields. Look, save a bit for Blossom. Save a bit for Blossom. Here you go. Run a bit. You have to be quick before your mum gets it. Oh, <laughs> too <laughs> slow. Their, their main purpose, oh no, wait for you to get your... Their main purpose in life is to graze these fields where they gather the nutrients, take them up and ship them in the barn at night. And then I can use them in your to kind of build soil in the garden, build soil in the polytunnel and build ecology as and where I want it. And then as well as that, Nefa here gives us milk from which I make cheese. And if I'm feeling ambitious, butter, no, behave. And then also there's a kind of a, a kind of third byproduct, if you like, and that's that um, she calves every roughly two years, sometimes every year. And then if there's a bull calf, then I get meat as well. So, you know, I'm kind of using them to help me manage the landscape. All the animals here have kind of dual or triple roles and we work together to create and maintain a whole ecology. As our population increases from 7.3 billion of us right now, in another 40 to 50 years, there'll be another 3 billion people. So that's 10.3 billion people. And if you look at the amount of land that's currently used for farming, and we can know this because we have Landsat satellites that circle the Earth every four hours, and they take lots of pictures. So there's nowhere to hide anymore. <laughs> you know, you can lie all you want about, oh, no, we don't do that. But the Landsat photographs are telling everything now. So it says that 7.3 billion people use land that if you put it all together, it would equal about the size of South America. Now, that's a lot of land. <laughs> uh, and that's most of the land that's fit to farm. And we create that land by chopping down trees, of course, and then replanting with the crops that we eat. If we continue to do this for the next 3 billion people, it will require the size of Brazil, in addition to what we've got now, in order to feed those people. So true, there is Brazil, and there is a forest there that could be chopped down in favor of food production. That would give the Earth about perhaps 30 to 50 years of survivability before they totally collapsed everything, because 
Brazil produces 40% of the Earth's atmospheric oxygen. That's a sobering thought. Now, you know, the entire world should pay Brazil not to chop down a single tree because their oxygen depends on it. How many people know that? Well, they, they will after they see this film. <laughs> so, so I think, knowing what I know about all of the data collected through the United States Geological Survey, WHO, uh, NASA, uh, NOAA, all of these large governmental agencies, they just collect data and they put it out there for people to look at. So I've looked at that data and I have friends who look at that data for a living. And it says that this can't go on like this. If it does, here's what will happen. There's a wonderful book written by Jared Diamond called Collapse. Well, he talked about collapse of civilizations. You're going to talk about the collapse of the entire human population. to kind of work it out as we go along. You know, none of us have lived in this part of the world so closely to the earth. None of us have built sustainable infrastructure systems. Um, none of us have done this before. So yeah, and in many senses we are pioneers. And just with kind of good heart and good faith, we're kind of working it out and sharing information. This tree grows really well. This is how you look after it. You need to mulch it like this, prune it like this, and that way you'll have loads of fruit. You know, it's just it's, it's an intrinsic part of that culture. Yeah, this is quite a good example of permaculture design. So when it rains, the rain falls on the rooftops, gets gathered in the gutters, collected, and then is pulled and stored here. And so this, in principle, is a rainwater store. It is positioned here because it's directly above the Polytonlan garden where I can use it for watering. Yeah? Then in addition to that I've planted plant species which give me a kind of backup reserve uh, for food. There's a bulrushes and there's carp in there and all sorts, all sorts in there. There's a whole ecology in there and I also get a mulch harvest off of it about twice a year. So it's, so it's all quite kind of interlinked and hopefully intelligently designed, well it is intelligently designed, such that I can, in essence, it kind of looks after itself. You know, yeah, I have to kind of, I have, I have to kind of guide it, but, but for the most part, the holding runs on about two to two and a half hours a day. 
input which liberates me for the rest of my time to focus on other things. Yeah. And uh, this is this is the kind of heart of our growing scene. This is our polytunnel and in here we grow greens all year round. So we have salad all year round and then also here during the season we can grow some of the more succulent uh, crops tomatoes aubergine pepper all that kind of stuff yeah and also it, it's another space because nourishing us physically is really important and also you know we're human beings we also need nourishing emotionally and spiritually so it also gives us a hangout space So the idea about vertical farming started as a modest um, project in a classroom that I taught. The class was called Medical Ecology. I had seven students. I got about halfway through that course telling the students about environmental destruction or environmental disturbance that leads to health risks. So imagine you're in that class. How much of that do you think you could take before you got so discouraged and depressed that you wanted to go out and max out your credit cards and quit school. So about halfway through, the class came to me and said, isn't there anything going on out there that's more positive than what you're talking about? And I said, well, um, what did you have in mind? <laughs> I said, well, give us a week and we'll come back and we would like to work on something as a group that has some, maybe some potential for improving life in, let's say, Manhattan. Okay, so they focused down on, they came back and said, we would like to work on rooftop gardening as a means of supplying food for the people who live in that building. I said, that's a great idea. Okay. Uh, so, but you have to do the science. So what do you mean by doing the science? Well, you have to go to the map room at the 42nd Street Library, and the maps are as large as a dining room table. And there are two gentlemen with white gloves that turn these pages for you. And you can sit and you can measure the rooftop area using a protractor and rulers and you can tell me how much farmland there is in Manhattan and then what crop would you plant and how many people could you feed and that took them six weeks at the end of which they said um, 
there's X amount of land. It turns out that rice is the most energetic crop that you can grow in the least amount of space. And growing rice on the rooftops of New York City, minus the commercial buildings, we could feed about 2% of Manhattan. They almost cried when they told me that because that was not an expected result. Nor did it assuage them from the angst that they felt from the regular course that I was teaching. Okay, so I said, your idea is very good. Excellent, you did all the work and you did it right because you got a result that you have to live with. It wasn't the result you wanted, it wasn't the result you expected, but it was the result. So you're a good scientist, all right? So what if we took that idea of the rooftop garden and simply moved it inside the same building? What if we could do that? See, you've got six times as much land now. And if you did that to all the buildings, if you could feed 2%, six times that, that's 12%. Pretty soon you've got a system going and then maybe if we could farm all year long and the class was over. And they looked at me, well, you can do that? I said, of course you can do that. And then, <laughs> all right, I didn't know we could do that or not, but I assumed that whatever we say we can do, eventually we can do it. So all I had to do was uh, look up some high-tech greenhouses to find out that a lot of the work had already been done. And so that's where the idea about, we didn't call it vertical farming the first year, we just called it farming inside the building. But that summer, it evolved into the idea that eventually became the class project for the next nine years. Now you know that I've published a book on this subject. And as proof of concept, in the back of the book, in appendix number one, I list all 106 students over those 10 years that have participated in this idea. So if you think this is my idea, that's far from the truth. This is. 107 people putting their minds together on a single project. How, how can farming transform the world in a way that doesn't upset the ecology of the planet? Because farming in general has had a terrible effect on the way this planet behaves. Part of what we're doing here is turning the ecology around from a grassland based ecology back to a woodland based ecology because in, in essence we're creating a, what's called an agroforestry kind of environment whereby there's an abundance of fruit and nut trees as well as all those intermediate shrubs that can support our kind of multiple needs as human beings. Uh, yeah, look at it this way. It's the difference between agriculture and permaculture. So in, in agriculture, a farmer looks at a field and says, what crop can I have in that field? Uh, and what profit can that crop turn me? Yeah, whether it's kind of uh, maize or, or sheep or, or um, cows, or whatever it is for milk, whatever. That's how a farmer looks at it. And then he'll go to the supermarket and buy his food. Right, permaculture will look at how can I change this ecology so that it can meet my multiple needs as a human being. My multiple needs for shelter, fuel to keep warm, fuel for electricity, food, um, income, uh, fresh water, all, the, all these things, spiritual nourishment, these are all part of it. So that's, that in, in, in a way is another kind of cornerstone to how we view or how I view the world and, and what makes kind of Lamas different. So this is our vegetable plot. So in here we grow our kind of main crop vegetables, um, things like potatoes, onions, garlic, yakon, ochre, spinach, brassicas, all that kind of stuff. And this garden here, which is about, I would say that it's something like 15 by 20, so 300 square meters, is enough to feed, enough to provide main crop vegetables for our family and our volunteers seen all year round. And it, that kind of goes to show you don't need a huge area to grow your own food. You can grow a large amount of food in quite a small area. And bear in mind as well, here in West Wales, our, our growing season is quite short. So here we are now, mid-April, our grow, growing season is only just starting, as you can see from the beds behind me. And then our growing, growing season really is May through to October, something like that. So, you know, even 
you know, up here in the north, high up in the northern hemisphere, we're at 160 meters above sea level, you know, on a small plot, we can grow most of our own food. They're called khaki campbells, they're quite close to the wild mallard. Go around the garden, eating up the slugs and any kind of predators for the vegetables, that's their main purpose in life. Uh, it's a particular breed of duck, that, that's what they're doing now, see they're looking, they're, they're sniffling through the grass, looking for slugs. Yeah, that's what they do. And then I also get eggs from them. So I get about, well, three of them are younger. So from three of them, I get about 200, 250 eggs a year each. And then there's one that's in retirement who doesn't lay eggs anymore, bless her. She's got too old. And so this is my orchard area. So I've got 25 apples. I've got 52 hazels. I've got plums, damsons, cherries. And so this is, this is kind of at the heart of the plot. This is my kind of agro forestry kind of plot. And I employ the geese to keep the grass down. That's their main purpose in life. Uh, that helps the health of the trees. It's, it reduces the risk of uh, some of the fungi and diseases we get in this part of the world, most particularly blight. So that's my geese behind me with their little baby goslings. I've got two ganders, uh, Frodo and Gandalf, and then I've got four laying geese, and then um, a lot of those goslings are going to be become Christmas dinners. Actually, you know, for those people who like a roast goose, that's 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 where they're going to end up. This is the kind of battery bank of the garden. This is my compost scene, uh, and so here you can see. I'm layering household food waste with manure and with cardboard and with weeds from the garden. And so they get sandwiched together in a layer, they then get turned so the air can, can get to it and then turned again and then I end up with a super rich compost which then I use on the vegetable beds and in the polytunnel to, to help me grow. And basically I'm turning what is a waste or waste products, cardboard, weeds, cow manure, and food waste from the kitchen into soil and building soil. Right, so vertical farming per se uh, has taken many forms and it's a relatively new industry. It's only about eight years old. So, I mean, uh, if you wanted to be a critic of it, go for it. But there's nothing to criticize yet <laughs> because it hasn't really blossomed into something that you could point to and say, yeah, that's what I mean by vertical farming. Because everybody has a different concept of the way you should do this. So, for instance, there's a vertical farm in Chicago that used to be a meat smoking plant, all right? And I'm going like this with my hands because it's only four stories tall. The basement is used to grow tilapia. This is a fish that comes from Lake Victoria in Africa. It's a vegetarian. So that you can feed it uh, compressed pellets of vegetable material that's left over from another process, let's say from the corn industry or from the sorghum industry. As long as it's plant material and it's not contaminated with heavy metals or pesticides or herbicides, it's the food for the fish. The fish have something called a microbiome. That is, their gut tract has got bacteria in it that helps them digest their food. And occasionally, they have to excrete those bacteria. When they do, the bacteria go into the fresh water and they essentially explode, all right? Releasing the contents of each bacterium. That's nutrients for the plant. So if you shift the water from the fish by pumping it to the next level up, you can feed plants with the enriched water. It's fertilized. The plants remove all of those materials and put that into their biomass and return clean water back to the tilapia. It's a very clever system. So this closed loop, that's observing nature. That's how it works out there. Let's see if we can duplicate that using technology. And so that's 
That's what's been done. So that was an old building. What we're driving at is that this person, John Edel, who runs this organization called The Plant, he knew all of those technologies before he saw the building. And when that building went up for grabs, he says, I can use it. And the mayor of Chicago, in that case, uh, Mayor Daley, <coughs> said, I'll rent it to you for a dollar a year for the first five years as long as you make something out of it. Voila, that's, that's what he did. The other approach is to design one from scratch. Okay, so there's one going up in Jackson, Wyoming, called Vertical Harvest. It's three stories tall. It's run by two very foresighted women who decided to do this as a way of addressing unemployment among Down's syndrome people that live in Wyoming that have no jobs. And so she got a grant. They both got a grant from the state of Wyoming to explore the possibility of insinuating vertical farming in Jackson, which is one of the richest communities in America, by the way. It's the playground for the rich. And here they're, they're going to go skiing down a hill and they're going to see LED grow lights lighting up a building and they go, what the heck is that? And then when they get down and find out what it is, they take off their ski gear and go to dinner and they eat what that building was growing for them. What could be better? To get the advertisement across that farming is changing.